Hi, I'm Scott. Welcome back to Canard Boulevard. Today, we're going to be talking about preheating, why we do it, why we need to do it, why you should be doing it. Coming up. I always preheat. All right, before I go any farther, I got these new Amazon mics, these uh, wireless lab mics that plug directly into your phone and transmit wirelessly. And I tested them at home and I thought they, they sound pretty good. And so I thought I would use them on this video and they do not sound good. They sound awful. And they've got this uh, noise cancellation in there. It sounds like data compression where they're just using too much compression and it's all kind of swirly sounding. It sounds awful. So yeah, I'm not gonna be using these mics again. Unfortunately, I used them for this entire video. I apologize for the quality of the sound. I am a huge snob about sound. I like my sound to be good, which is why I usually use this Tascam lav mic, which is uh, very high quality, but very expensive. And I thought I'd try these new wireless ones. Yeah, big failure. So I apologize for the horrendous audio. Back to the video. I always preheat anytime the ambient temperature is below about 60 degrees. And why? Because our oil is not like automotive oil. It's much, much thicker. And at even 60 degrees, it pours kind of like maple syrup. It's, it's very thick. And it's hard to force that oil through all the tiny little passages inside the engine. At lower temperatures, it's even thicker. And at below freezing temperatures, it can actually congeal and block passages. If you block passages in the engine, that means critical items like crankshaft and bearings and followers and camshafts are, are not getting lubricated. And that causes a tremendous amount of wear. And our engines are not cheap. $60,000 for a uh, uh, Lycoming engine, you want to do whatever you can to preserve that engine and make it last as long as possible. And so it is incumbent on you to reduce the amount of wear, particularly at startup, which is when the most wear occurs. There are times when the airplane has not run for quite some time, and I will actually crank the engine after a preheat with the ignition off, fuel off, throttle wide open. So the throttle wide open causes the least amount of resistance to the engine trying to draw air in. And because there's no fuel or spark, that means the engine is simply rotating and there's no power pulses. Now a power pulse puts a tremendous amount of force into the crankshaft as the piston is being shoved downwards. But because we're rotating it with the fuel off and no spark, all it's doing is just rotating and the only force that we have is friction and against the spring of followers and valves and so on. So it's much, much less wear and I do that just to get enough oil circulating through that I see the oil pressure come up. So once I see the oil pressure come up, now I know there's oil through all the galleys and all the parts of the engine where I want there to be oil. Now I will stop turn on the mags, turn on the fuel, and start the engine normally. I don't do that every time, typically when the airplane's been sitting for a while, and of course only after a preheat to so make sure the oil is nice and thin and can get pushed easily into those galleys. And let's talk about oil pressure as well, because when your oil is super, super thick and, and viscous because it's cold, it's incredibly high pressure being pushed through your engine because it takes a lot of force to shove that thick oil through all those tiny little passages. You can actually, in some instances blow out seals because the oil pressure is just so high. Now the ideal situation would be to have a pre-oiler, like pre commonly used on expensive race car engines. It's a little electric pump that pumps oil through the engine before the engine ever even turns. So the very first time the engine starts to turn, there is no metal on metal contact because the oil has already been pumped through the engine. They are available for airplanes and it's something that is actually on my list for this airplane. And it's an added bonus, it's a backup pump. So if your oil pump were to ever fail and you lost oil pressure, you have a backup pump you can turn on that will circulate oil through the engine and keep your engine running long enough for you to get on the ground. I'll put a link to electric backup oil pumps like that in the description below. So we want the oil to be hot and lubricate through the engine first, but we want to do more than just the oil. I'm going to get into that in just a moment. Let's first talk about the different types of preheaters that are available for airplanes. The first and simplest is just a sump heater. It's typically a silicone pad that sticks onto the bottom of your oil sump. It has a heating element into it. You plug it into a wall socket. It generates heat. 
heats up the oil in the oil sump. The next type is one that has rings that go around your cylinder. Now this is typically done in concert with the oil sump heater. These rings have resistive elements in them as well, so it heats the cylinders as well as the oil and to a point the crankcase through conduction from the cylinders. Then there's the comprehensive type like a TANIS system where they replace bolts and inserts and uh, sump bolts and it basically have all these different things that, that go into different parts of the engine and heat the engine uniformly throughout. So it heats the oil, heats the block, heats the cylinders. The engine itself is all heated as one. And then the last kind is a, a newer one. Uh, I believe it's made by Aerosplat and it is a bolt that replaces the one of the drain bolts in a Lycoming that has the dual sump drains. And again, it just heats the oil. So those are four types of installed, permanently installed preheating systems in typically found in airplanes. Now you have portable systems that are not permanently installed. One is just simply a hot air, it just a heater that blows hot air up into the engine compartment that heats the engine up. Then you have combustion heaters, like a torpedo heater. You typically you'll find these on the ramp that uh, are used to heat up airplanes in the winter time. It's propane fired. It fires heat directly into a hose that goes into the engine bay. And the last is a light bulb. This is used by people who just leave it on all the time. They have a, maybe a blanket over the cowl and they put a light bulb up underneath and the, the heat from that light bulb is going to then warm up the engine to a point. Of course, light bulbs that actually generate heat incandescent are, are getting harder and harder to find. So that's probably not used much anymore. Let's talk about the pros and cons of each. You want to heat the entire engine, not just the oil. The reason why is because all the oil in the passages is still going to be thick and congealed. So you've got all this hot oil in the sump, but you still got no lubrication to the top end of the engine. Maybe a TANIS system would be, would be better because now the entire engine is heated. All that oil that's still in the, the passages and the galleys and so on is going to be hot and thin, so it will easily move through the engine. So a TANIS preheat system is pretty much a gold standard, at least that type of engine heating system where it heats the entire engine as well as the sump. TANIS system is probably the most expensive. Less expensive would be those cylinder rings along with a sump heater. Now you've got the cylinders heated. To some point, it's going to conduct into the block and hopefully into the crank as well. And then you've got the sump heating the oil as well. The combustion heaters, I'm not a fan of, uh, mainly because they put out very, very hot air. They can be 350 plus degrees coming out of those, those torpedo heaters. Yes, your engine is maybe running at that kind of temperature, but all the wires and hoses and things are being blasted with that heat and it can really do some damage if you're not very careful as to how it's being used and especially over time. So my solution is the electric air heater. It's cheap, it's simple, and it works and it heats the entire engine. Oil, cylinders, block, everything. It brings it all up to temperature. As you can see here, I have an electric heater. It's just a simple Amazon heater. I'll put a link to this in the description below. And I have a flange on the front that I've screwed in place and then an aluminum tube that leads up into the NACA duct. All the heat then goes up into the engine compartment and warms up the engine. If it's extremely cold, I would put a blanket on the top of the cowl to insulate it and it also putting plugs, cowl plugs at the back will help heat escaping at the back. So if it's very cold, this system will still work. The heater I keep on, on its lowest setting. It doesn't need to be blasting heat. And I will typically turn it on about four to five hours before I go flying. And I have a remote system on the wall over here that I can actually use my cell phone to turn on and off the heat in the airplane remotely from home. So if I know I'm going flying and it's cold, I'll turn on the heat a few hours ahead. By the time I get here, engine is nice and warm. And if you look at the graphs here, you can see a couple different flights. The first one here, my OAT was 51 degrees. And when I started the engine, the oil and CHTs are all 51 degrees. That's pretty cold for oil that's, that's turned into like gooey molasses. And as you can see, the, after two minutes, the oil temperature is only up to 57 degrees. The CHTs are between 140 and 168, but the oil is coming up very slowly. Six minutes in, the oil temperature is only up to 62. My CHTs have made it up to between 230 and 270. It took nine minutes of runtime to get my engine oil up to 100 degrees Fahrenheit, which is the minimum that I will allow before I take off in the airplane. Imagine with colder temperature, it's 
it, you could end up with 15 or 20 minutes of warm up time sitting on the ground, following your plugs, just waiting for the oil temperature to get warm. Now here's where I use my preheater. The outside air temperature was 42 degrees this day. I had the preheater on for four hours before I left. As you can see, at the time of start, the oil was at 116 degrees and the, my CHTs were already at between 152 and 168 degrees. So even at the time of start, my airplane's ready to go. I, I could take off because it's, the engine's warm enough to go. That's great for having warm oil and better lubrication, but if you preheat wrong, you can actually do serious, significant, and very expensive damage to your engine. So let's talk about that. Water is the enemy. Water is the single largest cause of corrosion in our engines. You wanna keep water out of your engine at any possible cost. However, water is one of the major byproducts of the combustion. You, you burn fuel, you get carbon monoxide, you get lots of other chemicals, but you get a lot of water. And some of that water gets into the engine crankcase as blow-by past the piston rings. So you are putting water vapor into your engine. Typically, the oil is going to be hot enough that that water is going to stay evaporated and it will come out through your crankcase breather vent. However, it doesn't all come out. Some of it gets suspended in the oil. At operating temps, that water is vapor. But when you shut down, your engine starts cooling off and that water vapor is gonna condense. It's gonna hit that dew point for the ambient temperature and pressure and water humidity and so on. It's gonna be different every time, but at some point that water is gonna condense and it's gonna fall into the sump. Water is heavier than oil, so the water is gonna to sink to the bottom of the sump. That's not great. You have water now in your oil. Now, hopefully the next time you fly, you're gonna get the engine good and hot and all that, that water that was in the oil, it's suspended and, and layered in the oil is gonna turn back into vapor and be sent out of the engine. But if you, don't get your en if you don't go flying enough that you get the oil good and hot for a long enough time, you might not get rid of all that water vapor. And now that water vapor is staying inside the engine as water, condensed water, that's bad. Something you can do to help this is when you come down and land, open, the oil filler or the oil drain or the dipstick and just leave it open. That allows a lot of water vapor to actually escape out of the engine, easily up to half. So you can lower the amount of water vapor in your engine by almost 50% or more uh, just by simply leaving that open. Now, I would highly suggest you put a flag on your engine to indicate that, hey, this is open because you don't wanna miss that as a part of a pre-flight. So, if you are going to do that, make sure you have a system in place that flags to let you know that, hey, this, this thing is open so that the next person or you, when you go fly the airplane, knows that, that, hey, that oil dipstick or filler tube is left open. That would be a bad day if you went flying with your filler cap off. So like I said, it's all about dew point. Above dew point, water turns to vapor. Below dew point, water turns back down to liquid. Now, how does this relate to preheating your engine? Let's think about a sump heater where you just have a pad heating the sump. It heats up the oil and it can heat it up above the dew point. Now that water vapor is gonna vaporize up out of the oil and rise up into the engine. But guess what? The rest of the engine isn't being heated. All the parts of the engine, the crankcase, Connector, connecting rods, pistons, cylinders, cams, those are all exposed and they're cold. So that hot water vapor is gonna hit all that cold metal and condense into water. It's gonna sit on those exposed metallic surfaces and it's going to rust. And over time, that's gonna drip back down into the oil and now it's gonna vaporize again as it heats up from, from contacting the oil and it's gonna cycle, that cycle is gonna repeat. So you're continuously bathing your engine in, in water which is the worst possible thing you could do. And it's going to cause your engine to rapidly corrode. Now, if you are just using a sump heater for an hour or two, and then you're gonna go flying and the engine's gonna get good and hot, okay, that's, that's good, but it's still not great that you're heating just the oil and not the rest of the engine. If you are one of the people that has a pad heater on your sump and you leave it on for weeks, that is the worst thing you can do. Because like I said, you've got a just continuous water cycle going over and over and over and you're just, just bathing the inside of your engine in water and it's moving and corroding and washing away the, the oil film on the protected surfaces. So bad for your engine. Don't do that if you just have a sump heater. There are some proven products like CamGuard that can help with that where you add this to your oil and then as you add oil through in between oil changes, 
uh, you add a little bit to go with each quart of oil that you put in. And this helps coat the cams and other metallic surfaces inside the engine and with a film that helps prevent corrosion. It's entirely compatible. It's safe. You can use this on certificated airplanes. It's FAA approved. And the cost of this is about a quart of the same as a quart of oil. It's well worth it. I use this and many, many people use cam guard on their airplanes. All right. So obviously a sump heater, the heat's just the oil is not great. What about a whole engine heater? Well, that's actually much, much better. If you look, when I had my hot air heater going, that was heating the entire engine, the oil was only at about 115 degrees, but the, the cylinders were at 150, 160 degrees. So you want the engine to be hotter than the oil because then you know that vape, water vapor evaporating out of the oil is not going to condense on the inside of the engine. That's what you want to try to avoid. So that's why a whole engine heater is what you really want to do. And you want to make sure that the engine is going to be hotter than the oil sump. My method of using a hot air heater does exactly that, as you can see. And that's because the entire engine is above the dew point. No condensation is going to occur. And if you want, you can leave that on all winter. It's not going to do any damage at all. In fact, it'll help because it'll prevent any water from ever condensing. Because if you think about it, the dew point can change with ambient air. So if you have moisture inside your engine and the ambient air temperature is fluctuating up and down, over, up and down, above that and below that dew point, you could have that cycle of, of water vaporizing out of the oil into the engine and then back down again as the ambient temperature, temperature changes. But if you have a heater on that's just left on, that will prevent that from happening. So that is actually a really good way of preventing corrosion in your engine. What about removing moisture from your engine once it's actually already in there? There are some products. Uh, the best one I can think of is the DryBot, which uses a desiccant to dry outside air. It takes air in from the environment, runs it through a desiccant to remove all the moisture, and then blows it into your engine, either through the oil dipstick or through a breather tube. But it basically floods the interior of your engine with very, very dry air. If there is any moisture in there, it will evaporate and it gets blown out either through the, the exhaust or however it finds its way out of the engine. But it's being continuously replaced with dry air to make sure that there is no water vapor inside your engine to condense and cause corrosion anywhere inside your engine. Dry bot is not cheap. It's about $1,300, but for a $60,000 engine and you're protecting that investment, I, I think it's a good investment. So that's all I have on preheating. Now my plane has been preheating for the last few hours. I'm going to go flying because it's a beautiful day. If you have any questions, comments, suggestions, or corrections, please leave them in the comment section below. And if I could get you to click like on this video and subscribe to the channel, I really appreciate it. The subscriber count has been growing greatly, but still only about 20 to 22% of the viewers that watch my videos are actually subscribed to the channel. So let's try and get that number up. Click subscribe. You get notified whenever I post a new one of these videos. Thanks for watching.